phone open today, you got your Bibles, flip over to Luke 15. I want to read verses 1 through 7 to kind of get our minds moving. So Luke 15, 1 to 7. <clears throat> this is what it says. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him, Jesus, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has one hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. What do you think about that? There is a tremendous celebration in heaven when a sinner recognizes their sin and repents over it and runs to Jesus. This is not something that we ought to discount or downplay or maybe even worse, discourage and deny from another person. Salvation, it is offered freely to all who will call upon the name of the Lord Every single person that has ever existed on this earth, that has ever taken breath in their lungs, is eligible for this. And it is never our place to hinder someone else from hearing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's the starting point of today's message. Because unfortunately, God's prophet Jonah, he attempted to do just that. Jonah saw and maybe personally experienced, at least to some capacity, the cruelty of the nasty people of Nineveh. And Jonah, he went out of his way, literally, to withhold the gospel message from those broken and needy people. So let me start off and I'll give you a life lesson that we all need to digest. My hurt should never hinder the hope of the gospel. It is crucial for us to be able to forgive like our Father has forgiven us. You understand why this is so, so important? It's because this has a rippling effect, and it can actually get in the way of the message of the gospel. Now, I want to stop and just say God is sovereign, and our biggest screw-ups and the, the times where we keep our mouths closed, where we should have opened them, it does not ever hinder our Savior. However, I will say, those blessings that you might be able to be a part of, they're not going to be your blessings to be a part of. God will use someone else, and if he doesn't use someone else, he'll use a rock. Right? That's what Scripture says. But it is not my place to condemn or judge another person. That is not my role. Even if, okay, now let's make that super personal. Even if that other person intentionally and maliciously caused me intense harm and hurt and pain, you can understand where that is. Even if someone falls into that category, you have to understand Jesus died for them just like he died for you. That's a toughie. Because there's sometimes we don't see it. We're clouded because of our hurt. But we have to understand, Jesus' blood covers the most heinous sin that anyone has ever committed, and that includes us. The same forgiveness is freely awaiting all of us who confess our sin, repent, and place our faith in Jesus. Now, an aspect that I love about Scripture is that Scripture records messy moments as well. It's not just all the crescendos, the high peaks. It also includes things that, I think, to our minds, we're just like, huh? 
Really? You're going to add that one in there? And that is what Jonah chapter 4 kind of is. As you read Jonah chapter 4, it hits kind of like a, a sledgehammer. It's like this balloon that you hear go, <clears throat> it's like a deflation, especially off of the heels of what just took place in chapter 3. Okay, great exultation and celebration should be expected following how all of this has un undertaken and how God has worked in the midst of these people. But that is not what you end up seeing when you open chapter 4. I want you to listen to how the historical account of Jonah concludes. This is what it says in Jonah chapter 4, 1 through 11. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what uh, would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm. When dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many hands? Okay, you gotta, you got to picture this in your mind. After what is potentially the largest account of people coming to know Jesus, and coming to know the Lord in all of history, Jonah becomes annoyed and angry. He is fussy. Here's the thing. Jonah knew God's character. Jonah knew that God was a gracious and compassionate God. Yet Jonah didn't want the people of Nineveh to experience that God. Jonah, he, he wanted them, he, he believed with every fiber of his being that all the Ninevites deserved was just God's wrath. They didn't deserve God's mercy. That's why he wanted to withhold that. So God, in his wonderful, kind of just his, his in-your-face kind of way, he gives Jonah a tangible, practical illustration. The Lord appointed a plant to grow, giving Jonah shade from the insanely hot temperatures of the Middle East. However, the scorching sun shrivels that plant up, and Jonah is left exposed, and he wishes for the relief of death. Jonah had deep compassion over the plant, there was part of him that mourned it because it was so beneficial to him. But Jonah had nothing to do with any aspect of the plant. He didn't cultivate it. He didn't water it. He did nothing to it at all. However, God, when you contrast it, God created each person in Nineveh. 
And God knows everything about them. And he knows all of their flaws and weaknesses. And here's the cool part. God loves all of them. So doesn't it stand to reason, since God has such an investment, that God would have a deeper level of compassion on them than Jonah would have on this planet. Today, we're going to look at that word, compassion. This is what we see all throughout this final chapter, but the message today it is entitled, just one singular word, compassion. Before we go any further, uh, let's just ask the Lord to just really meet with us today. Dear Lord, I'm honest, Lord, my head is swollen. There's a lot of stuff that's cluttering up there. And so, God, I pray that you would take all those things away. Lord, I pray for all of us. Lord, I know I'm not the only one that has things cluttered in my mind. And so, God, I pray for any agenda, any to-do list that we have, any other pressing matter that is on our minds and in our hearts, Lord, that we would be able to table them for a little bit that we'd be able to come to your word open, exposed, vulnerable, ready to hear what you have to say. And it is not enough just to hear it. God, I pray as we go through this today, I pray for the Holy Spirit to just pluck various areas. You are so good at putting a magnifying glass on areas where we just need you to work. Lord, you're such a great God. You don't force yourself. You could. You'd have every right to. But you don't. In your divine wisdom, Lord, would you allow us the Holy Spirit's guiding to slow ourselves down, to be able to confess or to agree with you about what you say, and then to be able to repent. Lord, this is the process of what took place leading into this chapter. This is what the Assyrians, this is what the capital city, Nineveh, and what is believed to be 120,000 people plus that came to know you as Lord and personal Savior. And so God, I pray as we open this word today, as we dig into it together, that you would work in our midst that the gospel would be front and center, and that you would challenge us by it. And we love you so very much. And praise your precious name. Amen. So what we saw last week is God gave Jonah a second chance to preach the message of repentance to these nasty, nasty Ninevites. He originally called them at the very beginning of this whole book. He calls them out and he says, Go. And he says, go and preach this message. But the second time, upon hearing that message, when the people of Nineveh are confronted with the short, pithy, little, small saying that Jonah shared, what ends up happening is there is this incredible, incredible response. <coughs> These people, they fast, and they put on sackcloth. They actually go further and they include their animals in all of this process. And what they're doing is they're asking God for forgiveness. They understand that they have offended a holy God. And they are grieved to the core over this. What you see in chapter 3 is there is this widespread repentance and turning to the one true God. Jonah chapter 3 closes with verse 10 that says, When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Again, originally, when, when Jonah goes on out, he gives this very small message, and it's very succinct. He says, In 40 days, Nineveh was going to be overthrown. Nineveh's wickedness was on full display, and God knew every aspect of it. God knew it way more than Jonah even began to understand it himself. And the judge of the universe 
He was ready to enact his verdict. However, seeing the brokenness and the widespread remorse of the Ninevites, God relented concerning the calamity he had declared. That word relented, it is a really awesome word. It means God was moved to have compassion. It all fits. It all flows. Observing the people of Nineveh's response, it redirected God. Instead of judgment and pouring out wrath, what God does is He extends compassion. God sees their heart and He gives them mercy. He lavishes them with grace. And it was wickedness. It deserved destruction. And it was set to be doled out in 40 days. I don't want us to miss that. This is a very clear, unless you react, unless you repent, unless you get right with God, the time is set. You had 40 days. But their reaction moved God. And God chose to withhold that justified punishment. Incredible. Again, I want to remind us what we open today with. Remember, when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. I cannot even fathom. I cannot even begin to imagine the celebration that occurred on that singular day. All of heaven was having a hoopla. I can't even imagine. But there was no joy in Mudville. Mighty Jonah was miserable. He was very melancholy. Seeing Nineveh's repentance, it angered Jonah. This is what you see in Jonah 4, verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. It's so important for us to understand that Jonah's reaction it was more directed at God's handling of the people of Nineveh than it was over the response of the people of Nineveh. At the heart, Jonah was really angry with God. This is God's fault. God allowed this to happen. Jonah felt God should have dispensed devastation and destruction upon the wicked people of Nineveh. And then, when God decided not to, what ends up happening is it triggered Jonah's anger. God's compassion was the catalyst for Jonah's drop in countenance. This was what really greatly displeased Jonah. Continuing on, Jonah 4, 1 through 3. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, Please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Now, there are not very many uh, positive examples that we can take from Jonah's life uh, as we read in this book. However, Jonah doesn't wait three days and three nights this time. Jonah's angry, okay? And Jonah goes immediately to the Lord. <coughs> That is something that each and every one of us can benefit from implementing into our own lives. Think about this, okay? If you are here today and you are concerned or you are anxious about something, can I encourage you to pray? Take it to the Lord. If you're here today and you are frustrated and you're troubled about something, you know the answer is still the same? Take it to the Lord in prayer. 
And if you're here today and you are confused or you're bewildered about something, get in line. Because <laughs> I'm there right now. I'm real puzzled by a lot of things. But there is a God that we serve that is so much bigger and not limited by this short-sightedness. I do not know how all of eternity is impacted by some of the prayer requests that we are going through at this church. But I know God does. And I know I can trust Him every single step of the way. Just like we have sang all morning long where He leads. He's leading. Are we following? And are we praying? That's a pretty good sign of it for following. Let me just tell you, God is not bothered by our questions. He is not problemed by our concerns. He is never overwhelmed. We need to freely vocalize all of these things to the Lord. We need to be people who have opened our hearts, and we need to be truly willing to be vulnerable in prayer. I have been to places and I have been to churches where we cloak everything with I haven't unspoken. Can I tell you, I am so grateful for a church that for the very, very vast majority, we don't go around saying, well, I haven't unspoken today. Okay? You let people into your life. Sometimes you let us in a little too much, okay? But you do let us in. You let us know what's going on. And I love that because here's the thing. We can pray for you. If I don't know, if we don't know, we cannot pray. And so I love our time of testimony and prayer and share. Are you really open? And maybe you don't do it in this large setting, but are there people that you allow into your inner circle to pray with you? You know, God already knows everything that's in your hearts. This is why he wants to hear it out of our mouth. As I think about prayer, part of prayer is what is known as confession, which literally means agreeing with God. Okay, Practically speaking, when our prayers are not answered, at least the way that we anticipate or the way that we would envision them to be answered, we still must agree with God. Okay? And honestly, that is what is implied at the end of the following illustration regarding compassion, which God ends up giving to Jonah. Jonah reveals the motivation for not going to Nineveh in the first place. It is just like we had already said earlier, because we kind of knew how this book ends. We had it all in front of us is because he knew God's character. It was obvious to Jonah that God was about to extend mercy to these wicked and cruel people. And as Jonah was processing it, Jonah threw a temper tantrum, and Jonah hated every moment of it. And now as he's reflecting on it all, Jonah requests to die. Jonah would rather not exist in a world where the Ninevite people had the opportunity to be extended forgiveness and mercy by God. That's what he's really saying as he's writing this. Can I just say that is a huge heart issue. And I love that God isn't quick to blow past that. Okay? It's like a magnifying glass is just going to hovering over that one for us. Because I think that is exactly how God deals with us. It's how he works in our lives. There is not the tiniest piece of our hearts which God doesn't want full access to be able to work and to be able to move. And so here it is. Jonah's going through all of this and there's just this giant spotlight pinpointing that one area of an angry heart. Now there's a lot of other things I'm sure God could have pinpointed, but that's the one that he's doing right here. In verse 4, the Lord said, uh, uh, do, you, 
have good reason to be angry? What this is, is this is a call to evaluate. This is an opportunity for Jonah to just pause and check his heart temperature. What really is causing us to become angry? What causes us to be displeased and easily frustrated? Now let's make that a little bit personal. I want to say anger, it is a God-given emotion. By itself, anger is not a bad thing. However, I believe very strongly, and you can dispute that with me if you'd like in a private session, but I will say this, I believe as Christians, we use that as a crutch. We use it as, well, we are righteously angry because someone took the last cookie <coughs> or whatever other silly thing that it is. That is not scriptural. There is very, very, very few occasions that we typically run into day in and day out that should bring us to that level of anger that we think we're justified. We need to be very careful in acting upon our anger. Just being angry, it is not necessarily sinful. But we do need to examine the motives of what causes our anger. And God, he is leading Jonah to ponder. To just take some time and reflect on this. Before you move any further, Jonah, and I'll be honest, from what you can read in the text, it seems like Jonah does that. I want you to notice that Jonah does not hastily give a response. It goes on, he says this in verses 4 to 6. Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it and sulked. Okay, no, nope, that was my version. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head and deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. So Jonah leaves Nineveh, and he travels to a spot east of the city, one that he would be able to see all of the ongoings down below from his Mount Crumpet. There he crafts a shelter to shade himself from the sun. Because here's historically what it's like. In this region of the world, temperatures can reach regularly over 100 degrees in the, more, in the, in the middle of the day. And that is only magnified when you are on health, higher elevations without shade. So this is where he's at. And as Jonah sat pondering and observing the impact of the message that was just shared, he was nestled up under what is called an appointed by God plant. That word appointed, it means prepared or assigned. This is not the first time that we've seen this, but this plant... It was created with a specific purpose in mind. It's actually the second time that this word appears, and it will be used again in just a little bit. But this second time, it should bring back to our minds what took place just a little bit earlier, where God appointed a giant fish to swallow Jonah. You understand, sometime beforehand, when God created this fish, that God had a specific purpose in mind. And that purpose was to swallow Jonah. I don't know what all else that fish did in his life, but there was one thing on his menu, and it was Jonah at one point. And in the same way, when God cultivated this plant, it was also with Jonah in mind. This was going to teach Jonah something. So going on, verses 7 and 8. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head, so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die. 
saying, death is better to me than life. This is where the story really starts getting fascinating. Okay? The third created being that has been appointed <coughs> is something that God has designed with a specific purpose. It is this worm. Think about that. From a giant fish to a plant to a worm. Nothing escapes our sovereign God. There is a plan and purpose for it all. God is in control. We can take that, especially as we're going through some of our prayer requests, and we can go, okay, I don't understand. But if God is able to appoint a giant fish for a purpose, God's able to appoint a plant for a purpose, and God's able to appoint a worm for a purpose. Understand, he's able to appoint all of the calamities we face for a purpose as well. When I think about this worm, my mind instantly envisions the very hungry caterpillar. And so he starts munching and chewing and eating. He's probably gone through a lemon tree. He's gone through all these different things, and he just eats up and devours this plant. Then the sun reaches its peak. It's at the hottest part of the day, and Jonah, he starts to bake in the sun. It gets to be so hot that Jonah again for the second time in this passage, wishes that he was dead. In Jonah 4, 9, the first part of that, it says, Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? This repeated question is again meant to prompt inner evaluation in Jonah. Jonah should have so learned the first time and shut his mouth and just pondered what God is proposing. But now, this one seems to fall on stubborn and deaf ears. Jonah doesn't stop this time. Jonah ends up blurting out. Ah! Yes, God, I have every reason to be angry. Ah! <laughs> That's kind of how I read it. And he reads, this is what he says. And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Nah, nah, nah. And the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? When you really think about Jonah's answer to this, Jonah's reason for his anger, it is so self-focused. It is so self-centered. It's basically, I'm not comfortable. My circumstances are stinky. That's what he's saying. He's throwing a temper tantrum. He's like a six-year-old boy. Not that I have any experience. <laughs> and God quickly brings Jonah back to reality. Jonah had compassion on a plant that he had absolutely nothing to do with. Jonah didn't plant it. Jonah didn't cultivate it. Jonah had done nothing over this. This plant came up in a night. That is the literal translation. And it perished in a night. All Jonah did was reap the benefits of the shade of the plant. God, on the other hand, when you think about God... God knew each of these individuals who were created in his image. And he knew them before they were even formed in the womb, Scripture says. God loved them with an everlasting love. And God had a specific purpose for them long before they even knew it. <laughs> the people of Nineveh it says they were ignorant. They didn't know any better. And look at how they responded once they were instructed. What a massive, massive coming to the Lord. 120 people repented and believed in God. If ever there is a reason for compassion, 
God saying, this is it, Jonah, and you're missing it. It's before your eyes and you're so self-focused, you don't see it. Let me ask, does God's compassion for us, when we start to think about all the goodnesses He has ever done, everything He has ever done on our behalf, does that motivate us? Does it challenge us? Does it convict us? Just take, for instance, the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew contains several accounts where Jesus, it says that he is moved with compassion for people that are in brokenness. Matthew chapter 9 is what it says in verses 35 to 38. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people. And all those people that he has been interacting with, those that he has been healing of their diseases, of their sicknesses, he's seeing them. It says, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Let's make this personal. The harvest is plentiful. There is so many people that are honestly at this point in life, they are ripe for the picking. They actually want to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are just right now in that place where there may be a smidge ignorant. They don't fully understand the gospel. They need to have people share it with them. And this is what it says in this passage. Jesus, as he's interacting with these people, yes, he does an incredible miracle in, in their situation, but what he does is he has compassion on them. He sees them, and he's broken for them in their state. It goes on another passage, Matthew 14, 14. When he, Jesus, went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Matthew 20, verses 34, moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Jesus saw his creation as he was interacting with them, and he saw them in their broken state. He saw them, and, and all that was entailing because of the fall of sin. He saw their brokenness. And he felt compassion. And this moved Jesus to perform miracles, and he healed them. And in other passages, he says, okay, I healed them, and that's amazing, and that's awesome. But I want you to understand, that, no, he says, I, I, I forgive them of sins, and so that you know that I have the power to forgive them of sins, I say, arise and walk. You understand, what's really at play is a heart-level issue that God is addressing with all of these people. He did a lot of things where he healed people in their physical states, but it was all pointing them to the one wonderful miracle. And this is what the book of Jonah is all about, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus, the only time he ever compares himself to any prophet, it is to Jonah. And he says, just like Jonah was in the belly of a big giant fish, for three days and three nights, I too am going to die. And I'm going to be gone three days and three nights. But I have good news for you. Like Jonah was vomited up on that the eye of the, the lamb, God is going to rise from the dead. He is not going to stay dead. There is such tremendous hope in our compassionate God who saw our plight. And he said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He didn't leave it just at words. Jesus took on flesh. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a tremendous act of love, a tremendous act of compassion played out. That's what our Savior did. He saw us. And God, He demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while there was nothing redeemable about us, it says in Scripture that He died for us. <coughs> he laid His life down a once-for-all substitutionary sacrifice, taking your sin, taking your punishment, taking my sin, taking my punishment, and paying it all in full. But here's the thing. It is a freely offered gift. That is what Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection offers for everyone. No one is excluded. But in order to receive that gift, you've got to take action. Just like the people of Nineveh, they responded in repentance. They said, we have sinned against a holy God. We are broken. We don't even deserve him to do anything. But we are going to, from our heart, with all of our remorse, we are going to just say, I am sorry. We are going to wear sackcloth and ashes. We're going to fast. Our animals are going to be included in all of this. Regardless of whether or not God acts and recants and relents. And I just say God's compassion toward us, it should cause us to reciprocate gratitude and reflect compassion to those that we come in contact with. So maybe, like we saw a couple of times in the book of Jonah at the end, we should just pause for a second, <laughs> reflect on this, ponder this over. How is it that we respond when there is uh, things that come on up into our lives where, where maybe God has chosen to extend compassion, mercy, grace, forgiveness to those who maybe we at first glance would think are horrible, wicked, rotten people. That is so self-righteous of us because we're no different. God saw us in that same state and he came to us. Please do not withhold that gift, that glorious gospel from anyone else. Does it drive us to prayer? Are we really men and women that are willing to take all of these things to the Lord in more than just, oh, I'll pray for it? But do we really take time and pray? When someone comes to know Christ as their Savior, when repentance is visible in someone's life, does it ignite a great rejoicing in our hearts? Or are we like Jonah, and it leaves us displeased and, and maybe downright angry? As we evaluate all of this, it is very revealing of what is going on at our heart level. And let me be honest, if we're falling on that side where we're holding and harboring anger, we got resentment there, can I tell you your ultimate issue and your ultimate beef, it's not with that person, it's with God. Would you get right with God today? Because it's really only affecting you. It's like bitterness. That's swallowing poison expecting someone else to die. That's so silly. Don't live like that. May each of us experience God's compassion for ourselves, and then stand in awe of God's compassion, especially as we see it in the lives of other vile and wicked people. Because the story is not about us. It's about the God that we get to serve. To God be the Lord. Great things he has. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. It transcends Old Testament, New Testament. It transcends your chosen people, Israel, 
and the pagan foreign nations just like the Assyrians, Lord, and it trickles all the way down to us. The gospel is relevant for everyone in every circumstance of all time. Lord, I pray that we see that. Whatever we are facing in our life, Lord, I know there are things that are just insurmountable. I can't begin to make sense of them all, and you've never asked me to. But what you've asked me to do is follow you. You've asked me to trust you. And Lord, you've never given me any reason not to. And so, God, we come before you today and we just reflect on this entire story of Jonah. Lord, may we not be like Jonah. When we hear you move, may we be quick to respond and say, yes, Lord. As you see all throughout the Old Testament, here I am, Lord. Here I am. That's a phrase that is frequently uttered by prophets and people that you call. May we fall on that side. Or may we not be resistant because we know your character. May we cling to your character and then through that understand your mercy and grace which was so important to us in salvation. It is freely for all. And let us be joyful in sharing that message of hope. And Lord, use it in our life. Draw us to you. Keep us close to you in it all. God, if there is someone here today that does not know you as Lord and personal Savior, if they're still in the place before Jonah came and preached repentance, as short and pithy and maybe as pathetic of a message as he gave, Lord, may there be someone here today that hears this message that Jesus died on the cross for them. He suffered a physical death, taking punishment and taking a, a pain that belonged to us. And he bore it on that cross so that we did not have to. And he proved that he conquered death, hell, and the grave in his resurrection. And today he is seated next to his heavenly Father, receiving all the glory and honor that he has always deserved. Lord, do we recognize that? Has there ever been a time in our life where it's more than head knowledge? Where it's more than, I've clung to my parents' faith. I've clung to, to going to church or doing this or that. But it's really based upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. As I evaluate and ponder it, but I don't know if I have a relationship. And I'm concerned about it. Lord, I pray that we don't just sit on that concern, but Lord, that we seek and ask. Lord, that we engage in a conversation that we're vulnerable enough to bring other people in. Help us. And for those of us, Lord, that have maybe accepted you as Savior, Lord, this is still incredibly relevant to us because the truth is, Lord, there are times and there are seasons where we just get where we get frustrated at circumstances and people. God, I pray that you would help us to see our forgiven state, that we can recognize what the cross has done on our behalf, and that we would not begrudgingly withhold that, but that we would use it for your glory and honor every moment we get. And let us never forget to give you praise for it all.